Welcome to Accounting with Audra. This is part two in a series on ASC 740, Accounting for Income Taxes. In this video, we will discuss how to use a tax basis balance sheet to record and track temporary differences, as well as the importance of valuation allowances in determining deferred tax asset amounts. Companies that are subject to U.S. GAAP generally have numerous different assets and liabilities on their financials, many of which are valued differently for book versus tax, thanks to different recognition principles between U.S. GAAP and the Internal Revenue Code. A useful way to track and record all deferreds is by using a tax basis balance sheet. Let's start by reviewing the example discussed in Part 1. We have a newly purchased truck valued at $100,000. The truck is depreciated for U.S. GAAP using straight line convention over five years and for tax using 50% bonus depreciation in year one and then straight line over years two through five. Evaluating deferreds using a single asset is not near as difficult as tracking the depreciation differences in hundreds of assets. We'll continue to use our single asset in this example, but note that this method may be applied to the culmination assets, depreciable assets without having to analyze any one asset on an individual basis. That's what makes using a tax basis balance sheet simple. To use a tax basis balance sheet, you want to compare the basis in your accounts from both a tax and book basis. In our example, on the first day of the purchase, the book and tax basis of the asset is the same, $100,000. No differences reside in our example. Once we apply year one depreciation amounts under both rules, we determine the book basis in our depreciable asset is $80,000 and the tax basis in our asset is $50,000. The net difference in basis amounts to $30,000. Utilizing a 21% effective tax rate, the tax effective difference is $6,300. The value of our deferred on the financial statements should be presented as this tax effective amount at $6,300. Since no difference in basis existed at the beginning of the year, our net change in the amount represented is also 6,300. Let's journalize this. In year one, assume we have taxable income of $340,000. We will record a credit to income tax payable for the amount owed to the IRS using our taxable income of $340,000 times 21% gets us $71,400. Our deferred tax liability computed comparing our book and tax basis balance sheet is $6,300. Recall, we are recording this as a deferred tax liability, not as a deferred tax asset, since the difference will give rise to future taxable income. Finally, income tax expenses float to record total tax on book income accounting for our differences. This plug is a debit to income tax expense of $77,700. Going back to our tax and book basis balance sheet, Let's compute the varying basis over the next few years and work through how to make our adjusting entries to deferreds based on year-by-year -year changes. In year two, we continue to have a difference in both our depreciation amounts during the year and a difference in the ending value of our asset. The total tax effect of that difference decreases from $6,300 in year one to $4,725 in year two. How is our adjustment to the deferred balance recorded? Let's assume in year two our taxable income is $420,000. We will record a credit to income tax payable for our 21% tax liability on a base of $420,000. In other words, $88,200. The amount we will record to our deferreds is the decrease of $1,575, our amount at the end of year one compared to the amount at the end of year two. Our deferred tax liability computed comparing the change in our book and tax basis balance sheet is 1,575. Since this account established a deferred tax liability in year one, we'll continue to book our entry to the deferred tax liability account. However, this is a reduction to the liability, so in this case, it will be in the form of a debit. Income tax expense is, the, is then plugged to record total tax on book income, accounting for our differences. This plug is a debit to income tax expense of $86,625. In year three, we continue on with the same set of steps. Compare the prior year difference to the current year difference 
In this example, we again get a decrease of 1,575. So we're trying to adjust our deferred so that the ending balance in the deferred is 3,150. Remember, these are liabilities and assets, so they carry over from year to year on the balance sheet, and we're just trying to adjust the difference with our journal entry to get to the right ending balance. We compute our income tax payable by multiplying our current year taxable income by 21% to get 54,600. We debit our deferred tax liability in order to continue decreasing the book tax variance by a computed 1,575. And finally, we plug income tax expense so that our journal entry is in balance and reflects actual tax recorded on book income without consideration of timing differences between book and tax rules. Although our example illustrates only one asset account, Setting up a table of all assets and liabilities with book tax differences will simplify both recording annual changes as well as validates the amount of DTAs and DTLs recorded as appropriate. Setting up your analysis in one year may prove daunting, but can be ideal for tracking what various balance sheet items generate deferred tax assets and ensure that you eventually recognize those assets. We used a deferred tax liability as an example but it's important to recognize that deferred tax assets are future tax deductions and can be very valuable to a company. Bucketing DTAs into those that, that arise from future tax deductions on a return versus net operating losses and carry forwards of credits like foreign tax credits as, is important as not all DTAs have an unlimited carry forward period and rules regarding how certain DTAs like net operating losses and credits are recognized, as we have definitely seen over these past several years, can be easily changed. If it is determined that a deferred tax asset may not be recognized, this gap requires that a valuation allowance be recorded against the deferred tax asset. This determination is made annually and can have a significant impact on the effective tax rate of a company. When we first started discussing accounting for income taxes with deferreds, the object was ensuring that timing differences do not sway the effective tax rate of a company year to year. Establishing a valuation on a deferred tax asset negates that. A valuation allowance is established by crediting the valuation allowance account, which is a balance sheet account, and debiting income tax expense, which means it impacts the P&L of a company. A valuation is considered a contra account and offsets the deferred tax asset. In the notes to financials, companies are required to show both the original DTA, the offsetting valuation allowance, and the net asset left to be recognized. It is critical that a company maintain tracking of their DTAs to ensure that a valuation allowance is never recorded, thus negatively impacting the effective tax rate of a company. Furthermore, if a company has an existing valuation allowance in the books or is in the process of potentially recording one, it is possible to consider how taking advantage of accounting elections or optional tax positions can preserve these assets. The establishment of or the elimination of a valuation allowance can have a significant impact on book tax expense, providing for unexpected effective tax rate outcomes and subsequently earnings per share amounts. In our next episode, we will discuss how permanent items impact accounting for income taxes. If you like this video, please subscribe to receive updates when new videos will be posted. And as always, I look forward to receiving comments on other accounting and tax concepts you would like to see made easy.